As the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, progresses, the Department of Health and Human Services is taking away the religious freedom that all Americans are guaranteed by the First Amendment by requiring that all employers, regardless of religious conscience, provide all forms of contraception to their employees and even to minors without the knowledge of their parents. In response to this assault on the Constitution, Catholic leaders are stepping up and are searching for what can be done within the bounds of the law to deliver quality health care that follows the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. The Make Straight the Pathway Conference was held in Houston, Texas in March of 2013 on the campus of the University of St. Thomas to shed light on the critical problem of providing quality health care and protecting everyone's religious freedoms. David Barton, founder and president of Wall Builders and a recognized expert on First and Second Amendment rights, addressed the historical perspective of freedom of religion and rights of conscience. Richard Dorflinger, associate director of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, gave a presentation on how the Supreme Court has interpreted changes in the freedom of religion. I want to kind of start on the issue of government and faith from a 30,000 foot view. I want to show you kind of where we are today and then take you back to where we've been to see if we can find some applications out of that. So starting with where we are today, we are a very, very blessed people despite the things that we complain about often. Uh, we have been blessed with a form of government unlike any other in the world. There's 192 nations at the UN this year and that number goes up and down every year. But of those nations, we are the only one who's been under the same form of government for 236 years. Same piece of paper for that entire time. If you look at Europe, and Europe is considered to be somewhat stable, uh, France has had 15 constitutions in the same time we've had one. Poland has had seven constitutions since 1919. Russia has four since 1917. Afghanistan's had five constitutions since 1923. Every other nation seems to average a revolution or a turnover in government every generation or so, not us. We've had one for that entire duration of time. That's unprecedented. But we've been different for the reason of a philosophy, quite frankly. Um, ideas lead to results. And so we've had ideas that have been different from other nations. And that's what I want to hit for a moment, is what philosophy caused us to have the stability and the prosperity that we have. And you go back to our founding document, to our birth certificate. And that birth certificate in 45 words, our founding fathers told the rest of the world, as, as they said, they wanted to tell the other nations why we were doing what we were doing. But I want to take the first 45 words and look at the first three principles of government. These were number one, two, three on their list of six principles. You start with the statement that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unaitable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. From this, the first point we're told is they believe that from an official government standpoint that there is a divine creator. This was not a declaration of private individuals. This was an announcement to the world of what we in the United States, uh, the Continental Congress, were, were telling them on why we were doing what we're doing. On the day that they finished the Bill of Rights, they on that day asked President Washington to declare a National Day of Thanksgiving. It was the first National Day of Thanksgiving we had in America. We'd had some as the Continental Congress, but the first time in a federal capacity and Washington issued this proclamation. And by the way, we've been very blessed. We own about 100,000 documents from before 1812. So I own thousands of the handwritten documents of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, et cetera. This is the original proclamation that was issued by George Washington in 1789. What's significant is why did he issue a national Thanksgiving proclamation? The very first paragraph, I want you to see the philosophy behind his thinking. Why was it that he called the people to stop and acknowledge God and thank God? And this is what he said. He said, it is the duty, and I would emphasize the word duty. That's a strong word that we don't use in this generation near as much. It is a word that has consequences with it. But he said, it's the duty of all nations to do four things. Nations are, number one, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Number two, they are to obey His will. Number three, nations are to be grateful for His benefits. And number four, nations are humbly to implore His protection and favor. And please notice that it is nations. It's not individuals. So this is a corporate responsibility we have as a people to acknowledge God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And so convinced were they of how important this was as a people and a country that even if you take one of our least religious founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson, he said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we remove their only firm basis? 
Now, according to Thomas Jefferson, our least religious founding father, what is the only firm basis of national liberties? He said, it is a conviction, and I would emphasize the word conviction. It is a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they're not to be violated but with his wrath. He said, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Now, Jefferson says the only way you can preserve your liberties is you have to have a conviction in your mind that those liberties come from God and that if you start messing with them, you're going to tick him off and then we're all going to be in trouble. The second point, let me point you to the phrase where they said that we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. From that, the second point we hold in government is that there are certain rights that come from God, not government. There's a certain set of rights we got just because we're human beings, period, across the board. No government gave them. You find these rights given in the scriptures before there was ever a government in place. They're God-given rights. I also love the way that Alexander Hamilton talks about these rights. He says, inalienable rights are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They're not in government documents. He says, they're written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the aid of the divinity itself and can never, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. These aren't rights that you find in a document. These are rights that come from God before there was ever a government in place. Well, when you look at what's included in able rights, those who wrote the documents talking about able rights tell us what they are. For example, if you take Sam Adams, and Sam Adams is called the father of the American Revolution, he said, well, we told you in the document that there were three among others. And he said those three were, first, a right to life, secondly, to liberty, and thirdly, to property. So life, liberty, and property were three God-given rights that, that preceded any human government. But as the Declaration said, these three were among others. And so 11 years later, when we had finished the, the revolution and we're now writing, we've written the Constitution and we're now writing the Bill of Rights, they went back and said, you remember we told you there were three among others? Let us give you some of the others. And so the Bill of Rights goes through and lists other unalienable rights, rights that come from God, not government. The right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, the biblical right of self-defense, the sanctity of the home. Go through all the amendments. They're all God-given rights. They were all set apart from government. Government was not to touch those rights. And by the way, let me point out that here in Texas, we used to have this philosophy very clearly. Our Supreme Court of Texas, back in 1913, dealt with the issue of civil unions back in 1913. At that point in time, the Supreme Court of Texas has now said, well, it says, marriage was created when God made Adam and he made Eve and put them together and they had a family. And it went through and said, marriage is a biblical institution created by God. We in civil government have no right to regulate something we didn't create. It is his institution. We want to, they said, it would be sacrilegious to call a civil contract when it's something that God created. We have no authority to regulate something he created. So that was the belief on the separation of, of jurisdictions. So that is the second belief that we hold is, number one, there is a divine creator. Number two, he gives certain guaranteed rights. And look at the third part of those 45 words. It says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now, their belief was that government exists to protect inalienable rights. That's the first purpose of government is to protect inalienable rights. A number of founding fathers made this very clear. James Wilson, he says, the principal object of government, number one thing of government, is to acquire a new security for the enjoyment of rights which we were previously entitled by the immediate gift of our all-wise and all-beneficent creator. If God has given us an able right, the principal purpose of government is to make sure we can pursue the right that God's given us. So that was understood as being the purpose of government. Now, Sam Adams said a very similar thing. Sam Adams says government was originally designed for the preservation of the inalienable rights. Now, this is when he also said, and by the way, those rights are the right to life, to liberty, and to property. That's why government was instituted to protect those issues. And in this day and age, we thought, we think, wouldn't it be really good if that thing about the right to life had applied to abortion, you know? But we've been dealing with the March for Life for 40 years and et cetera. If they'd just been talking about abortion, it would help us today. And I don't know why we think they weren't talking about abortion. Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. As long as people have been pregnant, there were people who didn't want to be pregnant. Abortion is nothing new. As a matter of fact, in the collection of works that we have, here's a book on abortion in America back in 18, 1808. It is not a new issue. It has not been a new issue. What has changed is technology. So when he says a right to life, literally, that's what he means. None of the founding fathers wrote about that. Let me take you back for a moment to James Wilson. This is what James Wilson wrote in his law book telling students about laws. He says, with consistency, beautiful and undeviating. Human life, from its commencement to its close, is protected by the common law. 
He said, in the contemplations of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb, and by the law, that life is protected. Now, the point of technology is, as soon as you know there's an infant inside, it's protected by the common law. The signer of the Declaration, John Witherspoon, actually took a step further, and he said, this is what makes the difference between America and Europe. He said, in Europe, they believe that parents create children. And therefore, in Europe, they allow abortions in Europe. He said, but in America, we don't believe parents create children. We believe God creates children. Therefore, we do not allow abortions here because life comes from God, not from parents. Now, see, this is something that they talked about, they wrote about. It was in the law books. Abortion was a common law offense, a violation of common law. So we have across America this huge protection for rights of conscience. John Quincy Adams said very simply, he said, the transcendent and overruling principle of the first settlers of New England was conscience. That's what drove people here. And so when they got here, guess what? They wanted to protect rights of conscience. Now, James Madison understood that, and this is what James Madison said. He said, government is instituted to protect property of every sort. Remember, government's protect inalienable rights, those first three inalienable rights, life, liberty, property. He said, government's instituted to protect property of every sort. He said, conscience is the most sacred of all property. Now, we think of property sometimes as real estate, Conscience is property. Government exists to protect property of which conscience is the most important part of property. You also have George Washington who talked about the rights of conscience in this way. He said we should be very cautious of violating the rights of conscience in others, ever considering that God alone is the judge of the hearts of men and to him only they're answerable. Government doesn't judge the hearts of men. Therefore, government has to say, all right, I may not agree with you, but I respect your right of conscience because you answer to God. You don't answer to government for what you do. Now, this is where it gets fun because these guys were very familiar with the concept of separation of church and state. First Amendment, this is what we point to for separation of church and state. Okay, this, this amendment. You read it, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There are two clauses there. The first is called the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Co Congress can't make us all the same religious practice or habit or anything else. And second, Congress can't prohibit the free exercise thereof. That's the free exercise clause. But notice, the only entity limited by the First Amendment is Congress. It doesn't limit individuals, doesn't limit people, doesn't limit hospitals or doctors, doesn't limit kids, it, doesn't, it limits Congress. That's the, because their version of separation of church and state was it was always the government trying to intrude into religious affairs. They weren't scared of faith. They're scared of the government trying to regulate faith. So that's their view of separation of church and state. Because of that, we protect the rights of conscience for all sorts of folks that the country may not agree with. I mean, quite frankly, we protect the rights of conscience for conscientious objectors. As much as we are pro our soldiers and we support our soldiers, we also support the right of people who say, I want nothing to do with that. It had been Quakers at the time of the American Revolution. It's now all sorts of other groups. But we don't force people to fight in wars against their conscience. We have conscience protection also for Jehovah's Witnesses. We patriotic, love the country. We have states across the country saying the Pledge of Allegiance, but we do not re require Jehovah's Witnesses to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They believe they pledge only to God loyalty. They don't pledge loyalty to any human authority. So we don't require Jehovah's Witness. That's freedom of conscience. We have the same thing with the Amish. They say everybody else has compulsory education, 12 years of education. Amish say, no, under our faith, eight years is all you need. Eight years is all we believe the Bible requires. We go, great, have eight years. We're not going to have you, require you to have 12 like everybody else in the nation. Same Christian scientists and vaccinations. You got to have vaccination to go to school unless you happen to be a Christian scientist and then your faith says, we don't do that to our children. So we say, fine, you don't do that to your children. That's the rights of conscience. Same with Muslim and Jewish men not required to shave their beards. You can work in places that you have to be clean shaven. Oh, if you're Jewish or Muslim and, and you're practicing your faith, you don't have to be clean shaven despite what our policies say. The same with Seventh-day Adventist. I don't want to work on Saturday. Yeah, but my job requires you to work from Monday through Saturday. Well, not for Seventh-day Adventists. They have the right by conscience to not be fired for not working on their day of worship. So if I take you back to these three principles of American government, there's the divine creator. The divine creator gives enable rights to man. Government exists to secure those rights. One thing I can point out for dead certain is a secular government will never be a limited government. You got secular leaders, they will get involved in all sorts of areas that they should not be involved with, including the rights of conscience. Show me any secular government in Europe that is not intruded into the rights of conscience. It just it won't happen. You have to have leaders who believe there's a creator. He gives rights. Government exists to protect those rights. Therefore, I will not touch those. That's out of my jurisdiction. I can't, I can't do that. 
So there's a political solution to this, but that's the historical history that we have. This is a well-protected, well-defined right in American history. Thank you guys for letting me share with you. Tim, thank you, sir. Just, uh, there are many federal laws, actually, that, uh, that affirm a right of conscience in health care. I'm going to talk about, very briefly, about the three most important ones. And this, uh, this trend began right back in 1973, right after Roe versus Wade, the abortion decision, with the Church Amendment. Uh, it continued in the 90s with uh, laws like the Coates-Snow Amendment, and uh, finally in 2004, and in subsequent years, the Hyde-Weldon Amendment, which even throughout all of these debates about conscience has been approved by Congress and signed by Republican and Democratic presidents every year as part of the annual appropriations process from 2004 to the present. So to give a little more detail about each of those, uh, the Church Amendment is not named after the Catholic Church. Uh, it's named after Senator Frank Church, Democratic Senator from Idaho. Uh, in 1973, there were two threats he was addressing. First was Roe v. Wade itself. In the wake of Roe versus Wade, with the Supreme Court saying that abortion had the character of a fundamental right, the pro-abortion attorneys started to say, well, that means that everybody is entitled to an abortion. Everybody has to have ready access to abortion. So the people who object to abortion need to back down and uh, help provide it. There should be no right of conscience. Uh, and in 1973, people thought, well, maybe that's the right interpretation of what the Supreme Court has told us. You know, if you say that voting is a fundamental right, then nobody can get in the way of your right to vote. So maybe that's what that means. Congress said no. Congress said no. <clears throat> people have to have a right to make a choice against abortion as well. And the other forcing, uh, uh, forcing event was a decision by a federal court in Montana that said a Catholic hospital in Montana, because it received federal funds, had to perform sterilizations against its conscientious beliefs because it was the only uh, uh, hospital in the area that provided a ready uh, facility for doing sterilizations. And Congress responded to both of those. There are subparagraphs to the Church Amendment, B through E. Uh, a disappeared at some point, I'm not sure why. Uh, but subsection B is to address especially this uh, Montana situation. Uh, the receipt of federal funds, and there are certain specified federal programs, cannot be used by a court or other public authority to force an individual or an institution to participate in abortion or sterilization. So even then, uh, the conscience rights we were talking about went beyond even abortion itself into, you know, the really other... Uh, into the family planning arena with sterilization, uh, contrary to moral or religious convictions. Subsection C said that, that uh, entities receiving federal funds may not discriminate in employment and training and education against medical students, nursing students, for example, because of their views on abortion uh, or in sterilization. That actually, uh, and that provision is sort of double-edged. It means you can't exclude someone because they favor abortion either. Subsection E talks about medical schools in the same light. Uh, there's another part of subsection C that says, if you're an entity that receives federal funds for biomedical or behavioral research, you may not discriminate against healthcare personnel because of their willingness or unwillingness to take part in any lawful health service or research activity uh, in accord with their moral and religious convictions. And subsection D, which I think has been unexplored in terms of its potential impact, because it's really very broadly stated, and this is a direct quote, the others were paraphrases, but that no individual can be required to perform or assist in the performance of any part of a health service program or research activity funded in whole or in part under a program administered by the Secretary of Health and Human Services if his performance or assistance in the performance of such part of such program or activity, I love the way lawyers talk, would be contrary to his religious beliefs or moral convictions. That covers objection to anything in any program, any medical program that receives funds from HHS. And of course, with one thing about the passage of the Affordable Care Act is that 
There are a lot more medical programs now that are funded in whole or in part by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Now, Code Snow is also named after its sponsors. It came some years later in 1996, and it's a, uh, it is written into the U.S. Code. It was actually passed as part of a Budget Reconciliation Act and signed into law by Bill Clinton. And uh, it was responding to an effort by the ACGME, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, to require that all OBGYN residency programs provide an opportunity for abortion training. And uh, it was also saying, in effect, that medical residents uh, should, uh, uh, should have to get that training. And the government responded with this amendment, saying that no federal agency, no state or local government receiving federal funds could discriminate against an individual or institutional health care provider for failure to provide abortion or abortion training, to receive such training, uh, or to uh, refer for or pay for such abortions or training. We followed up in 2004 with the Hyde-Weldon Amendment, which was passed as an addendum to the Hyde Amendment that's against federal funding of abortion, uh, with the help of uh, Congressman Dave Weldon of Florida. And this took the policy of Coat Snow and clearly applied it to the full range of individual health professionals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and the full range of contexts where abortion might be involved. So this is just the text of the Hyde-Weldon Amendment. Uh, defines healthcare entity that's protected, you'll notice, very broadly. Any individual physician or other healthcare professional, hospital, provider-sponsored organization, health maintenance organization, health insurance plan, or any other kind of healthcare facility organization or plan. So that's potentially a very powerful defense against governmental discrimination based on uh, declining to be involved in abortion. This one is specific to abortion. There are a lot of other uh, conscience laws. I'm not going to go into the details of those, but uh, because of the, 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 the focus now, the attention given to the contraceptive mandate, it's interesting to note that the only other time that the government said that contraceptives must be provided by private health plans was when it established standards uh, in the year uh, 2004 uh, federal employees' health benefits plans. Uh, it's a program in which private health plans compete to be put on a list, a book of options for federal employees. They can go through that book and choose whichever one they want, and then the federal government will subsidize the premiums and pay most of the premiums. And uh, the government did impose a contraceptive mandate, and then it turned around and say, said any insurer that's religious it has a religious objection. It was not defining whether it's a religious organization, but it said any insurer that has a religious objection is exempt, period. And then it said, in those health plans, any individual healthcare professional, doctor, nurse, pharmacist, who has a moral or religious objection to those items has to be exempt, can't be discriminated against. Anyway, so why, why is our problem? What happened here? Well. The problem is that some professional societies have not gotten the message. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2007 put out an ethics opinion report that said uh, there are limits to conscientious objection. But uh, when they start acting on them, there's a big problem here because uh, women have action, must have access to all of these, you know, abortion, sterilization, everything else. And so if you will not do these things, you must be willing to refer for them. Not only must you be willing to refer for them, but you must make sure you are facilitating ready access to it. It would really be a good idea if you're a pro-life physician to make sure you locate yourself very near an abortion clinic in order to allow the woman's conscience to, uh, to get an abortion to prevail. And then there's the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there are all kinds of problems of conscience coming out of the Affordable Care Act. It, uh, it gives uh, each health plan the freedom to decide whether it will include elective abortions, but uh, once it does decide that, it must require every enrollee to pay in an additional premium for other people's abortions, whether they object or not. 
The Affordable Care Act is not covered by Hyde Weldon because it funds these programs outside the bounds of the appropriations bills. Uh, there is a conscience clause saying that health plans may not discriminate against pro-life providers, but it doesn't say anything about the government itself setting requirements that provide that uh, require people to get involved in abortions. The religious exemption is only for a church or association of churches or the specifically religious activities of a religious order. If your religious order prays, it's exempt. If it has an employee that works in the gift shop to sell jams, you're not. So the current laws are deficient. They're not doing the job they need to do. Why? Because they only have a very limited scope. Church amendment, for example, only covers funding under certain federal programs. The enforcement mechanism is deficient because the one thing that the Obama administration kept in its rules was if you have a violation, you go to the Office of Civil Rights of HHS. HHS is the perpetrator here. Uh, solution. Well, uh, you might be hearing later about the lawsuits. As you know, there are at least 48 lawsuits against the mandate, over uh, 140 plaintiffs, for-profit, non-profit, Catholic, other religious. Uh, one of the for-profit companies uh, sells only Bibles and religious materials, but the administration says you're a totally secular organization. You have no, no right. Colleges, universities. The nonprofit suits have been delayed because the government says we're still working on the details of that. And there's a legislative avenue. Just introduced this week is the Health Care Conscience Rights Act of 2013, H.R. 940. It was introduced by Diane Black and Jeff Fortenberry, who will be with us tonight. I'm sure you'll hear more about it then. And, uh, and uh, uh, John Fleming. And they had, they had sponsored past conscience legislation as well, but they put all their, their resources and their energies together on this one bill. Because this bill addresses just about all the deficiencies I've just mentioned in the current laws. Uh, now has, it uh, was introduced with 48 other sponsors. There are now 67 sponsors and counting. We need a lot more. We, we want a majority of the House to co-sponsor this legislation. There's no reason why we can't get there. Uh, the second main provision is the Abortion Non-Discrimination Act, and that fixes the loopholes and deficiencies in the Hyde-Weldon Amendment and puts the right of people not to be discriminated against by government in the area of abortion on a much firmer and more permanent basis solves the uh, constitutional challenge about uh, uh, having the only remedy being withdrawal of all funds because it gives people a right to go to court and to have the court set the appropriate remedies in order to stop the discrimination. And that last section is this right of action. All these laws get a right of action. The uh, Code Snow Amendment as amended, the new conscience exemption to the preventive services, and the church amendment. Everybody who's discriminated against under those, they don't have to go begging hat in hand to a hostile health and human services department. They can go directly to court and get defense of their rights there. And as I say, given the preliminary injunctions that are happening right now under the preventive services mandate, we are doing better in the federal courts than we are with the administration. Finally, what to do? We want to urge Congress to pass this bill, and we want to urge them to attach it to must-pass legislation so that the Senate, which is not as uh, friendly to us on this issue as the House, will have to deal with it. We wanted them to put it onto the continuing resolution the House just approved. They didn't do that. Uh, they said they didn't have the votes to do that, partly because uh, a lot of conservative Republicans were going to vote against the bill on fiscal grounds and then they needed votes from Democrats. And the Democrats are not friendly to the conscience rights issue here. And just in general, join the public debate. Insist that uh, what we're talking about here is one of the fundamental rights that any government has to protect, as was said, and that it can't be pushed aside for other agendas of any party. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jeff Gardner. And on behalf of the John Paul II Life Center and the Christus Medicus Foundation, thank you for watching this presentation. The need for more crisis pregnancy centers and Christ-centered medical practices throughout the United States is critical and ongoing, and we'd like to encourage you to get involved. Before you do, 
there are a couple of important takeaways that we'd like to leave you with. First and foremost, develop a strong and clear vision of what it is you want to create. Be sure that you understand the distinctions between a crisis pregnancy center, a family practice clinic, an OBGYN clinic, a multidisciplinary medical practice, or a sonogram center. Familiarize yourself, too, with the not-for-profit laws as they pertain to health care in your state. John Paul II Life Center operates within the state of Texas. Your laws may vary. Also, before you begin either to explore a crisis pregnancy center or a Christ-centered medical practice, get the blessing of your bishop. Get a committed and unified board. If you can, get the cooperation of your local Catholic hospital. Organize and identify physicians who can be key in helping you getting your project off the ground. Develop a strategic plan, and within it, include the right professionals, those that you'll need to advise you in all aspects of your endeavor. Familiarize yourself with the fundamentals of fundraising, communication, and education. Everyone involved does not need to know how to do everything, but everyone involved should know about everything that needs to be done. To open a Christ-centered medical practice, understand the financial operations of a clinic. When considering the financial arrangements needed to establish a clinic, it has been our experience that the first year costs, including salaries, is a minimum of $500,000 and can be supported by a recruitment agreement for a physician with a cooperating hospital. Also, care should be taken to consult with an appropriate practice management company to assist you in setting up the medical clinic and to get the correct assistance with licensing, credentialing for hospital privileges, and third-party contracts, as well as billing and collections with the best electronic medical records and healthcare information technology available. Right now, a national platform is under development to include a service company that will help take advantage of economies of scale so medical clinics and pro-life centers across the United States can be created. For more information, please contact us at Kimberly at jpiilifecenter.org. That's Kimberly at jpiilife.org. C-E-N-T-E-R dot O-R-G.